Let's turn now to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, beginning with verse 18. Chapter 9, verse 18. <laughs> Nine eighteen. Now, between verse 17 and 18, Jesus and his disciples have journeyed from Bethsaida on up to Caesarea Philippi. So, how much time interval is here, we don't know. There could be a two-month, three-month time interval between verses 17 and 18. But at verse 17, we found Jesus at the conclusion of the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves and two fish. And that incident took place at Bethsaida. Now, this next incident takes place at Caesarea Philippi, which is probably 45 miles away. Caesarea Philippi is at the base of Mount Hermon, and it is the place of the headwaters of the Jordan River. There at Caesarea Philippi, the Jordan comes right out of the ground. Huge spring. And begins its journey southward to the Dead Sea. And so, in your mind now, move from the Sea of Galilee, from the shores of the sea near Bethsaida, and we're up now in Caesarea Philippi looking at that huge uh, granite base of Mount Hermon, watching the beautiful water as it springs forth just out of the ground itself and flows past us, and Jesus is there with his disciples. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples were with him. Now that sounds like a contradiction. While he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. The translators of the King, New King James sought to uh, clarify that by interpreting it rather than translating it. And they have the disciples joined him. But in the Greek, literally, it is just uh, being alone, praying that his disciples were with him. Whenever Jesus was praying, really the whole world was shut out. Whenever he was praying, he was alone with the Father in prayer. Now, in a sense, prayer for Jesus was far different than it is for us. When Jesus prayed, he didn't have to go through anybody. His prayers were just directly to the Father. When we pray, we pray to the Father, but we have to go through Jesus. And so we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus as we are inspired or as our prayers are inspired by the Holy Spirit. But Jesus didn't have to pray through anyone. His was just a direct access with the Father. And so it was more of just a, a time of fellowship, conversation and all with his Father. And Luke points out in his Gospel some seven different times when Jesus was praying. 
before the major decisions of his life, before facing a crisis, we find Jesus was always in prayer. The thing that that says to me is, if he, being the Son of God, felt the necessity of prayer before a crisis or before a major decision, how much more I need to pray about the decisions in my life and about the crises that I might be facing. It always amazes me that prayer seems to be the last resort that people take. We will try almost anything. We will go to all kinds of uh, ends to try to find a solution or an answer. And prayer seems to be the last resort. When in reality, prayer should always be our first resort. We should pray before we try to do anything else. We should pray before we ever tried to make any decisions. And I am certain that if we would pray first, we wouldn't have such desperate prayers afterwards. But it's because we just go headlong into a situation without seeking the mind of God or the will of God that we've so many times find ourselves just sort of cornered or trapped. And then there's no way out, and then our prayers are always in desperation, and, you know, there's an, a certain urgency to the prayers. Jesus, as his disciples joined him, said to them, who do the crowds say that I am, or the multitudes? Jesus isn't interested in what the king had to say about him. He wasn't interested in what the rulers had to say about him. He wasn't really interested in uh, what the priest, the religious leaders had to say about him. Who do the multitudes, who do the crowds what are they saying about me? Jesus was always interested in, in the common person. He was interested in their opinion. What were they thinking? Really didn't concern him much which, what the king thought. You know, there's, there's a strata of life that they, they seem to be above everybody else. And, and Jesus cared little for that. You know, he, he could care less what they thought. What are the common people? What are the multitudes? What are the crowds saying about me? They said, well, some say that they think you're John the Baptist. Now Herod had beheaded John the Baptist. And so those that were saying that he was John the Baptist probably had developed some crazy theory. And people are very good at that. You know, you, you get in your mind a theory of who the Antichrist is going to be and how he's going to appear and all this. And, and you start espousing these crazy theories, you know. And, and so there were some people who had the theory, well, this is John the Baptist. Somehow he is, he's come back from the dead, and, you know, and, and it's, it's John. Others said, he must be Elijah. Now, according to the prophecy of Malachi, Elijah is to come before the great and the notable day of the Lord, to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers. That is, he's going to turn the people back to the God of their fathers. Elijah is going to come and prophesy again and turn people back to God. 
And because this is a prophecy of Malachi and is yet to take place, there were those who thought that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi, that actually he was Elijah and surely he was turning people to God. And so there were those who thought, well, this is Elijah. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi. Others were saying that one of the old prophets had probably risen again. Now, Moses declared, and there shall come another prophet, like unto myself, and unto him you shall give heed. And because of that, many of the Jews are looking for a prophet, a man to come, like Moses. That they might give heed to him, and they believe that he indeed will be the promised Messiah. For over 400 years, God had been silent. Malachi was now dead for 400 years. The last of the prophets before this long period of silence. God finally broke the silence after 400 years. He broke the silence through John the Baptist who was a prophet. And what was God's first word that he spoke to man after being silent for 400 years? Repent. I often think that if God would speak again today, that would probably be his first word. <laughs> Repent. It's a word that we don't care too much about. It is interesting that in the final messages of Jesus to his churches, to five of the seven churches he said, repent, change. And this is usually, I think, God's first word to man. You know, when God begins to deal with a man, usually the first word is repent. Let's change. So those were the opinions. You're John the Baptist. You're Elijah. You're one of the old prophets risen again. So then Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? Now, it is interesting to me that in all of the speculation concerning Jesus, the crowds and their speculation, that there were not those who were speculating that he's the Messiah. I'm sort of surprised that the disciples didn't say, well, there's quite a few out there that really believe you're the Messiah. But that evidently was not the feeling of the crowd. And now, remember, this took place after the feeding of the 5,000. It took place after the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead, after bringing the widow's son back to life. You'd think that they would begin to get an idea that this is the Messiah. When, when John said, are you the one that we are, we're to look for? He sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one we're to look for or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus in that same hour healed many that were sick. He healed those that were blind and those that were lame and all. And he just said to John's disciples, go back and tell John the things that you've seen. How the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And, and that was, Jesus was saying, just go tell John what you saw. 
That was the evidence of his being the one they were looking for. That was the evidence that he was Messiah. But the fact that the people's eyes seemed to be blinded to this. So that this was not brought up as one of the speculations concerning him. Whom do the crowds say that I am? The crowds weren't saying that he was the Messiah. Why do you suppose that is so? I believe that their concept of the Messiah was different than what they were observing with Jesus. Their concept of the Messiah was a powerful potentate, a mighty king, a great ruler. And Jesus was very meek. He was very humble. He was touchable. He wasn't up on a throne someplace where a man couldn't touch. He was right here. Hey, we could reach out and touch him. And he was very normal. He was a very natural person. They felt very comfortable around him. And, and I think that Jesus sort of disarmed them by his naturalness and, and by his... Uh, availability to man. They, they really didn't think of the Messiah in those terms. They thought the Messiah would be, you know, just way out there, totally unreachable and untouchable by man. And so that, I think, is what kept them from cluing in on the fact that this is the Eternal One who will sit upon the throne of David to order it and to establish it in righteousness and in judgment. My, you know, surely that kind of a person wouldn't be right here where I could touch him and, and put my hand on his shoulders we're walking down the path and talking. But Jesus was always within reach of man. I wonder if Jesus were here today, how many would recognize him? You know, would we really recognize him? Would he, would he fit the mold, the, the image that we have in our mind, the, the idea that we have? Would, would he fit? Or, or would we be sort of surprised and shocked as they were surprised and shocked? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, the, the Christ of God. And remember the word Christ is, is the Greek form of the Hebrew Mashiach. You are the Messiah of God. Now, Matthew's gospel tells us that Jesus said to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon, the son of Jonah. For flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Jesus is declaring to Peter that this is not something that he analyzed, that he figured out on his own, but this came as a revelation from the Father which is in heaven. Now, I do believe that such is still necessary today. I think that many times we make a great mistake when we try to argue people into a faith or believing in Jesus Christ. I do believe that for a person to realize that he is the Messiah of God takes a revelation from the Father. And if tonight you believe that Jesus is the Messiah of God, that you do believe that because God has revealed that to your heart. Not because someone gave you some very convincing arguments and just, you know, blew away all your doubts. 
but there was a work of God's Spirit within your heart that caused you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah of God. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. What not of yourself? The faith isn't of yourself. It's a gift of God. And so God put that thought, that faith, that belief, that conviction in Peter's heart. You're the Messiah of God. Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, my Father which is in heaven. And so really, for those who do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah of God, we need to pray that God will work in them by His Spirit and give to them a spiritual revelation of the truth. And that work of God's Spirit within a man will do much more than all of our arguments could ever do in the convincing that Jesus is the Messiah of God. Now, Jesus at this point said something I find rather interesting. He said, don't tell anybody. Now that's just the opposite of what I would think that he would say. Now that you know it, go out and spread it everywhere. Let everybody know. But no, he said, don't tell anybody. Keep it a secret. Now, why do you suppose he told them not to tell? I believe the reason he told them not to tell is because at this point, they themselves did not fully understand the implications of his being the Messiah. And if they went out and told others, they also would not understand what the implications were. Jesus began to tell them what the implications were, and they had a difficult time with it. You are the Messiah of God. Don't tell anybody. Because you don't understand what this entails. The fact that I am the Messiah of God, I'm going to be despised and rejected. by the elders and by the chief priests. I'm going to suffer many things. And I'm going to be killed. And I'm going to rise again the third day. Wait a minute. I said you were the Messiah of God. That means you're going to be king. You're going to reign. Your kingdom's going to fill the earth. No, because I'm the Messiah of God, I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. The third day, I'm going to rise again. Peter began to rebuke him, say, Lord, shame on you for saying that. Be that far from thee. You see, the reason why I told them not to tell is because they did not understand at that point what it meant to be the Messiah of God. True, there were prophecies and there were scriptures that declared he would be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow acquainted with grief, but he would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities that he would be numbered with the transgressors in his death, that he would be smitten, stricken of God. But they chose to ignore these scriptures. Really, they chose to spiritualize them. Now, God really didn't mean that. What God meant was, and they would start to spiritualize the scriptures. One of the best ways of of, of destroying the meaning of a scripture is to spiritualize it. 
Because you can make it then mean anything you want it to mean. The minute you say, well, God really didn't mean that. Here's what God meant to say. Poor God, he just never can speak clearly so people can understand him. And so he needs me to stand here and tell you what he was trying to say. He fumbled a bit, you know, but I'll be glad to tell you what he was really saying. And, and when you start to spiritualize the scripture, you, you can take all kinds of liberties in, in inserting then your own ideas. And this is what they had done to the prophecies concerning the Messiah being despised and rejected and, and uh, cut off. The Messiah would be cut off and, and, oh no, that can't be. So what that means is God really didn't mean that. And, and they started to spiritualize the things. Taking away the true meaning. And thus, they could not in their minds conceive of the Messiah being cut off. That was totally opposite to their concept of what the Messiah was going to do. As far as the disciples were concerned, there were visions of sugar plums dancing in their head when the Messiah takes over the reins of this world. We'll show them. And there were even arguments going on among the disciples of who was going to be the greatest. You know, when he really wipes out the Romans and when he sets up his kingdom, I'm going to be right there at his right hand. And I'm going to be better than you and I'm going to have a bigger place than you, man. And, and they were arguing among themselves as who would be the greatest? Because they did not understand the implications of what it meant for him to be the Messiah. The implications at this point were not the establishing immediately of God's kingdom. He was not to overthrow the Roman yoke. He was not at this time to make Israel the ruling nation of the world. And so if people said, oh, the Messiah, you see, they would have started a revolt against Rome. The time has come. Israel's going to rise. Israel's going to rule the world. The Messiah is here. Let's start, you know, throwing spears at the Romans. And so Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Because the people had a false concept of the Messiah. And Jesus started to correct that concept with his own disciples, but he didn't get very far. When he started telling them, I'm going to suffer many things. I'm going to re be rejected by the priests and by the elders of the people. They're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise again the third day. It just didn't sink in. So much so that when he was killed, they forgot that he said, I'm going to rise the third day. They forgot all about that. They didn't remember that until he rose. And then they said, wow, remember? He said he was going to rise the third day. Oh, you know. But, but it, it, just, it just didn't penetrate, it just didn't sink in because it was so far removed from what they had developed as their preconceived ideas of the Messiah. I think that it is rather dangerous for us to get strong preconceived ideas that are developed on the theories that man has created. I think that it's important that we remain open to the Lord and to the Word and not get hard, fast concepts of this is the way it's got to be, you know. God might not follow your program and then you're all confused. And so Jesus, realizing that the whole concept of the Messiah was all messed up in the minds of the people, 
all messed up in the minds of the disciples. When Peter confessed, you're the Messiah of God, Jesus said, don't tell anybody. Because the cross to the Jew was a stumbling stone. The fact that he was to be killed, the fact that he was to be crucified, was so inconsistent with their concepts of the Messiah. And so when they first recognized, acknowledged, you're the Messiah, then Jesus felt it was important to begin to tell them what was going to happen. First time he began to talk about his death. He felt it was important to let them know. And then Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. He now sets out the conditions for a true follower. And the things that await those who choose to follow him. First of all, he must deny himself. It is not a path of glory that the Lord invites us to. We think, well, now, you know, if I'm first under the king, my, what a glorious thing, you know. He's not inviting them to a path of glory. He's inviting them to a path of self-denial. The glory is to be directed to the king only, not to the subordinates. And how far, deny himself, how far that seems to be from the self-esteem gospel that we hear today. Know that you are someone. You're wonderful. You're great. You're beautiful. You're glorious. Deny self. You want to come after Jesus. You want to be a follower of Jesus. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, and thought it not something to be grasped to be equal with God, yet he emptied himself, denied self, and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You want to come after me? Jesus said it's a life of self-denial. Secondly, you've got to take up your cross daily. Now, According to Luke's gospel, this is the first indication that Jesus gave of the cross. First time he spoke of the cross. He spoke of the cross in, in context of following him. As I am going to take up my cross, you have to take up your cross. He is beginning to indicate to them the way he's going to die. And the taking up of the cross daily is that submission of my life to the will of the Father. That's what is involved in your taking up the cross. That's what he means. You remember when he was in the garden, he prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but your will be done. And there was that total surrender to the Father if this cup cannot pass from me but except I drink it thy will be done and he drank the cup he submitted to the cross and my taking up my cross is just that of the same thing Father not what I will your will be done, and the complete submitting of my will to that of God's for my life. Lord, what do you want? What is your wish? What is your desire? 
That's taking up my cross. It is accepting whatever God gives to me as from him. Thirdly, Jesus said, follow me. Peter tells us that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. You want to come after me? You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up your cross and you're going to have to then follow me. Now, in following Jesus Christ, I've found a couple of things. To be successful, you have to first of all stay close to him. We remember that Peter tried to follow him afar off. When they left the garden and they arrested Jesus, took him to the house of Caiaphas, we read, and Peter followed afar off. There are some people that are trying to follow afar off today, but it really is never successful. What is the very next thing we read about Peter after reading that Peter followed afar off? What's the very next thing we read about Peter? The little girl said to him, Hey, aren't you one of his disciples? Didn't I see you with him? Nope, not me. Don't know him. The result of his endeavor to follow Jesus afar off was the denying of Jesus. And you'll find that that is true. If you try to follow Jesus afar off, when it really comes down to it, you're going to find yourself denying him. A second thing necessary in following Jesus, not just staying close to him, but also you've got to keep your eyes on him. You can't be looking here and there at the world and all of its enticements and, and, and really follow Jesus. You've got to keep your eyes on him. Secret of following him. Now Jesus gives an interesting rationale for it all. He said, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose his life for my sake will save it. There are those people that are always trying to find themselves. I hear people often say, well, I've just been trying to find myself. I went over to Hawaii, I'm just trying to find myself, you know. <laughs> went to Bora Bora, just trying to find myself, you know. Went to Europe, just trying to find myself. Always trying to find themselves. Jesus said, you want to find yourself? Lose yourself. The real answer to life is to lose it for my sake. Lose yourself in me. That's a part of denying yourself. The losing of yourself is denying yourself. And just to lose yourself in Christ. And he said, hey, then you'll really find yourself. The life that is totally submitted to God, that person who totally surrenders himself is the person who has really found what life is all about. They have found the reason for their existence. They have found why they are here because they have submitted themselves completely to God and that's why you're here. You are here to please God. That's the purpose of your existence. That is acknowledged by the elders in heaven as they respond to the worship of the cherubim about the throne of God as the cherubim are declaring holy 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 Lord God Almighty which is which was and which is to come the elders respond thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor because you have created all things and for your good pleasure they are and were created that's talking about you a created being of God you were created for his good pleasure and if you'll lose your life in him, surrendering to him, then you'll discover the real reason for your existence. You'll find life. And then he went on with another rationale. What advantage is it if you gain the whole world and yet you lose your own soul? How satisfying do you suppose it is to be the richest man in hell? 
Say, hey, man. I have more than anybody, you know. Or even the smartest man. You know, I had ten earned doctorates. And the Bible says, how dies the wise man? Like the fool. How dies the rich man? Like the poor. I mean, death is a tremendous equalizer. Because as Job said, naked I came in and naked I'm going out. I mean, it's all equal. I've never seen a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse yet. <laughs> One day a fellow asked the son of a wealthy farmer, How much did your old man leave when he died? And the son answered, everything. And that's how much you're going to leave when you die. You're not going to take anything with you. Now, what would it profit you then if in your gaining of the whole world you lost your own soul? What profit would there be? And if you will really look at that, you realize, hey, if I gained the whole world and I had the whole world, say, let, let's just really, let's really, you know, go far beyond limits. I was able to control the entire world. It's all mine. I'm sitting here on my little throne, looking over the whole world and saying, hey, I own every bank, I own every business, I own everything, it's all mine. And let us say that I could hold on to it for a hundred years. Now, we realize both are impossible. Number one, I could never control everything, and number two, I could never hold it that long if I did. But let's, let's go to that extreme. Let's take it beyond the limits. And I died at 120. And I spent eternity in hell. What real profit was there for me? Say 10,000 years from now, you come to interview me. And you say, was it worth it, man? <laughs> For a hundred years, you had it all. Yeah, but I've been here for 10,000. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world? Now, what is your highest ambition tonight? Now, I don't think any of you have the ambition of gaining the whole world, who would want it? <laughs> Man, the headaches and the mess. <laughs> but what is your highest ambition? What is your goal? What, what if, you know, the, the, the genie says three wishes, you know, what would they be? What is that which you consider the ultimate? You're striving for, you, you know, this is what I would like. Now, let me ask you this. If in the attaining of it, it cost you your own soul, would it be worth it? What should it profit a man if he gains the whole world? They don't want to gain the whole world, they just want to gain a part of it. Well, what if I gain the part that I want, and in gaining it, I lost my own soul? What would the prophet be? Your ambition, the fulfilling of it, if it cost you your eternal destiny apart from God, what value would there be? Then Jesus went on to say, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, 
of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and the holy angels. Now, notice this. Jesus said concerning his Messiahship, number one, this is what it entails. It entails my suffering many things. It entails my being rejected. It entails my being killed. It entails my rising again, but it also entails, notice, when he comes in his glory and in his fathers and all the holy angels. The being of the Messiah also entails the coming again in glory with the holy angels to fulfill those other scriptures of the establishing of the kingdom of God and sitting upon the throne and ordering it in the world in righteousness. That entails, and Jesus came to that, when I come and in the glory that you're looking for now, you're, you're, you're wanting that now. But you see, things are going to happen that are going to cause you to be really wiped out and, and ashamed. You're following me because you want glory. You're following me because you want a prominent place when I establish my kingdom. But look, I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. I'll rise again, and the day will come when I come in my glory. But don't get the wrong idea of the Messiah. Don't go spreading around that I'm the Messiah because things are going to happen that you're not going to understand and the world won't understand. So... Don't go out and broadcast that yet until they have a chance to really understand what being the Messiah entails. It entails death and resurrection. It entails coming again in glory to fulfill the promises and establish the kingdom. Jesus knew exactly what it meant to be the Messiah of God. At that time, no one else did. Though Peter had a revelation, thou art the Messiah of God, his revelation didn't go any further than that. It did not go on to the implications of being the Messiah of God. And so when he talked about being killed, Peter rebuked him. In turn, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, you offend me. Because you don't understand or discern the things that are of God and the things that are of man. Man has a concept of the Messiah. God has a plan for the Messiah. And you can't tell the difference. You don't have the discernment. You're thinking from the man side and from the glory side and all. But listen, it's denying self. It's taking up your cross. It's following me. And it's not being ashamed of me when I submit to the cross. Because if you're ashamed of me, then when I come in my glory, I will be ashamed of you. So things are going to happen that will cause some of you to be ashamed. but I'm coming in glory. So, next week we'll take up in verse 27, and I want to put verse 27 with the transfiguration, because I believe that what Jesus was talking about when he said, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God, I think that it is quite possible that Jesus was talking about the transfiguration. There's another possibility, and we'll take that next week when we get there. Uh, but I, I think that he was talking about his transfiguration. Shall we stand? What are you saying about Jesus Christ? 
Who is he? Who is he to you? Is he a prophet of God? Was he a great teacher? Or is he the Messiah of God? Is he the Savior of the world? Is he your Redeemer? Jesus is interested in what the crowds are saying about him. He's interested in what you're saying about him. Because he's interested in you. Because he loves you. That's hard to accept. But what are you saying about him? Have you denied yourself to take up your cross to follow him? God help us. Because though I would gain the whole world, if it cost me my soul, I made a bad deal. I did a foolish thing. My eternal destiny should be my primary concern above everything else in life. Because if I miss out in the kingdom of God, anything else that I might have gained or achieved or attained is meaningless. May the Lord be with you and watch over you and keep you in his love, fill you with his spirit, cause your heart to just overflow in his richness, in his love and in his grace, in Jesus' name.